Today we're going to talk about the Holy Trinity as well as the Unholy Trinity. Now you likely know that the Holy Trinity is referring to Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit being one, united as one God, but yet three distinct persons. Now this is something that's very unique to God. It's not something that we can really compare it to. Just like the eternality of God is something very unique to Him. It's very hard for us to grasp because we have nothing else to compare it to. Now, with that in mind, the unholy trinity might be something that you're not as familiar with. This is what scholars often use to refer to Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, which are all mentioned in the book of Revelation. Now, the reason that they likely use this to refer to these three is because they seem to be trying to imitate the holy trinity. Right? When we look at God, we see God as the one who has ultimately the authority in the trinity. Certainly, Jesus and the Holy Spirit have authority over all of us. They are still God. But in the three persons, Jesus seems to submit to the Father, seems to submit to God the Father, and the Holy Spirit seems to submit to Jesus and the Father. Because Jesus was sent by God, but Jesus made it very clear, I will send the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit seems to submit to Jesus. So when we look at this, we look at the Antichrist, the Satan, and of course, the false prophet, we see the same dynamics. Satan seems to be the head honcho here, right? He seems to be the one who has the authority among the three, and he's, of course, prepared the Antichrist as well as the false prophet, but the false prophet seems to submit to the Antichrist. Now, we also see that God sent Jesus, of course, and Jesus, after he died on the cross, it was God who raised him from the dead. In fact, this miracle was one of the biggest forms of evidence that the disciples of Jesus used to show people that Jesus was someone they needed to take seriously. Because Jesus had already done many miracles, but yet God raising him from the dead was clear evidence that, hey, God himself is okay with Jesus. God himself sent Jesus, and that's why he raised him from the dead. He wouldn't have raised him from the dead if he was a liar, if he was a sinner, if he was a bad person. Therefore, when Jesus said, I am one with the Father, and God raised him from the dead, that was the biggest evidence to show that God really did send Jesus. In much the same way, we see that the, the Antichrist is going to go through a very similar situation in the sense that he is going to be attacked. We're not sure what exactly this attack is going to look like. Uh, the implication in the book of Revelation was that he was going to be attacked by the sword and fatally wounded. Now, being attacked by the sword, it might be just referring to someone is going to attack him. They didn't have guns back then, uh, so John would have just used a sword, perhaps symbolically, just to refer to there was going to be some kind of a conflict. He wasn't going to be fatally wounded by old age or by sicknesses. Someone was going to try to attack him, maybe assassinate him, and he was going to be fatally wounded. Remember, Jesus himself actually died and was brought back from the death from the dead, but Satan likely does not have that ability, and therefore Satan could not wait for the Antichrist to die and bring him back from the dead, but rather he had to wait until he was fatally wounded, very, very close to death, and then Satan was going to heal him completely, and then it says the world is going to wonder after this and wonder how did this person, this world leader, go from dying almost to the point of death to now he is completely healed and everyone's going to wonder after him and some people are going to start to believe in this Antichrist. Again, it's likely that the Antichrist is trying to imitate Jesus and that Satan is trying to imitate God in this situation. Then we see something very interesting. We see that uh, in the Bible, of course, the Holy Spirit was the one who Jesus sent, and the Holy Spirit was supposed to help the witnesses of Jesus point to Jesus, right? He was supposed to help bring us to the point where we can put faith in Jesus. And once we put faith in Jesus, he was the one who seals us with, of course, the Holy Spirit is the seal, so that until the day we are redeemed. Now, what does that mean? Of course, we don't really do this in today's society, but basically, when someone was in that time, when they would buy something or purchase something, likely a large purchase, maybe it was land or something like that, there would be a type of scroll, kind of like a receipt or a deed, and that scroll would be sealed with a wax seal with the signet of the person who purchased it. And when that person came back to redeem it, right, to pick up what he had purchased, that seal was allowed to be opened. But until he came back, the seal was not allowed to be opened. So the seal is supposed to represent an, who the possession belongs to. So in much the same way, the Bible says we are bought with a price, right? Jesus 
died on the cross for our sins. He paid for our sins. We are his purchased possession. Once we accept salvation, we become his, and we are sealed with his signet, if you will, the Holy Spirit, who seals us until the day he comes and redeems us. In a very similar way, the false prophet is meant to point people to worshiping the Antichrist. So the Holy Spirit points people to worshiping Jesus. The false prophet points people to worshiping the Antichrist. And not only that, but he also has a seal. Just like the Holy Spirit seals the believers, the false prophet has a seal. We call it the mark of the beast for those who want to pledge allegiance to the beast. And of course, there's going to be a lot of pressure for people to do that. They're not going to be able to buy or sell or anything like that. It says he's going to enforce this mandate to everyone. He's going to enforce this to everyone to where, uh, whether they're slave or free or rich or poor, whatever it might be, everyone is going to be forced to take this mark of the beast. And those who refuse are going to be suffering persecution for that. Now, again, we look at this and we say, wow, it seems as though the unholy trinity is trying to mimic the trinity, but of course, they're not going to be successful. At least, they will be somewhat successful in the sense that there will be many people who take the mark of the beast. And many people, according to the Bible, they will have to suffer the consequences. What is this mark? It's not super specific, but it does talk a little bit about how it's the mark of the beast. It's like the name of the beast, or it says three numbers. Uh, 666. So with that in mind, we look at that and say, okay, this is how they pledge allegiance. Just as the 144,000, which we didn't talk about today, but during the tribulation period, there will be 144,000 people of Israel from the different tribes, 12 different tribes. They will be sealed with the name of God in much the same way the very next chapter it talks about, or in a very close chapter, it talks about how the Antichrist and the false prophet, they will start sealing people with the mark of the beast. So we see two different uh, seals during the tribulation period. One shows allegiance to God, has the name of God. The other has the, shows allegiance to the Antichrist and has the name of the Antichrist, name of the beast. So we're not going to talk too much about the mark of the beast today, but maybe in a, s a separate video, because I think a lot of people have questions. Uh, is the mark of the beast already out there? Can we take it right now? Obviously, you're not going to want to. Let me assure you, you will not want to take the mark of the beast. Uh, but is it out there right now? And that's a good question. And I think that the book of Revelation does give us answers. And certainly we want to talk about that, but we'll save that for a separate video.